So that's a piece of information that the church leaders will find very valuable. You're saying, this is what I come for. Do we give it? Do we provide it? Do we share it? Or don't it? When the PCC asked this question uh, two or three years ago, we came up with six different things that we thought that people looked for when they came to a service of worship. Uh, and I've regrouped them slightly, and they all begin with P. And they're great. Uh, so, <laughs> I think there's something about peace. There's something about a different way of kind of breathing, living, thinking for an hour. Just out of the hurly burly. We talked about it being a safe heart uh, when we talked about this a while ago. But there's also something about being picked up and shaken down and sent out. So at the end of the service, we encourage each other to go out to love and serve the Lord. So there's something about what I do the rest of the time is infused, infected. Uh, through what we do here, a sense of purpose. We know that people come to meet with other people, and when we were locked away, uh, locked down, we missed being with other people. And as we all say, being on Zoom is not the same thing. But it's something about being with other people. And then again, something distinct about being in church or being a home mindful of God is that we are in God's presence, that we come for worship, for prayer to listen to God's word uh, and to be enriched by his presence. Then I think fifthly, well, five and six about preparation again. But preparation for this life uh, may well be that we learn things together, whether by uh, um, expressed teaching or just listening to other people's experience of life. We're kind of prepped to go out thinking, well, I'm, I'm now going to have a bit more, I have to control my anger. I know what it is to be patient and hopeful. That's something, of course, about preparation not only for this life out there, but for the next life. It says this life is always inflected with that expectation that there will be a greater and richer life that this prepares us for. So those are my six key headings. If you might have put something down on a sheet of paper, a bit like those, and maybe you come up with a seven. That'd be great. If you ask the question, why does the church exist? <clears throat> I think people often immediately think of my church with the spire, or my church with the tower, or my church wherever it is. Why does the church exist in the back of doing things? But I think if we ask the biggest question, why is God creating a church at all that will exist into eternity? My first answer is to love it. Paul talks about the church being the bride of Christ. And in that context, he's not talking about what we wear, he's talking about that Christ wants to love the church. And as we are loved, we love in return. So there's many things we can talk about in terms of the future, but it seems to me at the core of what the church is about, that's not just about here and now, but for eternity, is that we're learning to love, to love God, be loved and to love other people. So that's my first line there. Why does the church exist to be loved and to love? So then we pull that eternal uh, purpose into here and now, I think it stops us saying it's about doing all these things that we can immediately list. We don't exist for that reason. We exist in a slightly different way to celebrate the love of God in Christ. Some of the language here I'm using is taken from the diocesan vision and strategy, and that's their expression, the love of God in Christ. There's something about experiencing God's love in Christ that changes our life, and we want to celebrate that. And that applies to different people in different ways. But it's something that we can celebrate. It's something that brings hope and joy and purpose and refreshment to our life. But I kind of inserted that phrase to celebrate the love of God and Christ every day. Church is the people. We can celebrate together here and now in this hour. We talk about the celebration of Holy Communion. But we've also known and learned that we have lives beyond the hour that we're in church. And that's what, where we should be celebrating the love of God too, in all sorts of ways. So uh, Bishop Graham talks about the purpose of the church 
being in terms of worship and witness. He takes that from, uh, to Peter. But you are a chosen one people, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He says we proclaim the excellencies, well, clumsy word there, the greatness of God, back in praise to God, and to the world around us, worship and witness. They're different ways, but in the same kind of vein, Jesus talks about we love God, we love our neighbour and ourselves. All ways we celebrate the love of God in Christ every day. So that's where we start. What is it we're about? So I'm so on my next page now. Where, where is God, God taking us? What, what is this about? about? So I want you to think for a moment, but the next question is, can you describe some of the qualities of your ideal church? That's not kind of entirely fanciful, uh, but, you know, not just simply, well, I'd like it to have a dome rather than a spire, um, or whatever. What aspects of church do you long for, dream for, pray for, for us here at St. James? What's your ideal? And it might be in, in educated by where you grew up and the great experience you had of church there. Or you might be reacting about a church you went to before and you didn't like, and this has got to be different to that one. I don't know. But describe in, in four or five words your ideal church. Have a go. I'm going to move on. If you still want to carry on writing, then do. But I want to suggest that one way of expressing in a short sentence what God might be calling us to be, and in a sense it just begs another question, but is this phrase here, to become an authentic Christian community in and for Hampton Hill. Let's leave the Hampton Hill bit off for the time being. But to be an authentic Christian community. I think the keynote there is it's about people. The word community doesn't really occur in the New Testament as such. It talks about family or household. There's all sorts of uh, unexploded bombs around the word family, so I'm not going to use that word family. But we know what we mean. It's about people being together. Communion, as I said, we talk about as well, don't we? About the body of Christ, another picture of people being connected organically. So it seems to me that that's the centre of what God is doing. And we often say, you know, the church is people. I don't need to go to church to become a Christian, but yes, but church is part of who we are as Christian people. And then immediately follows a number of core activities that I've listed here. So we worship, we care for one another, we have ministry to children, we exercise our faith in action and we speak and witness uh, to the love of God in Christ in evangelism. So those kind of things, you know, they quickly accumulate around the word church. So when the PCC were thinking about this, I offered them three themes that in a sense would sharpen up what we're doing now. Because what we're here doing here is not trying to say, 
well, this is how we are, and over here is what we're going to be. And somehow we've got to drop all that. It's about sharpening up, focusing, uh, being clear on what our, our priorities are. And so we have these three themes, to be compassionate, to grow, and reaching outwards. So let's think about each of those in turn, and then I'm going to give you an opportunity to fill in the sheet, because this is where the rubber hits the road. It's all very well for the preacher to talk about airy fairy things about heaven, but what are we going to do? What are we going to carry on doing? What might, what, what, what might we start to do? So something about being compassionate, and that word is in the mission stuff from the diocese, but it's also used to just avoid using the word love the whole time. <laughs> but it's about that people caring for each other, isn't it? It's about our attitude when we are together, that we are selfless, that we care for one another. We put each other first. Uh, the least shall be the greatest, and the greatest least, the first, last, last, first. So it's about an attitude that we think of other people's needs. That also means, of course, that we support a whole number of uh, Good Works partners and charities. This church has a track record of giving money away and thinking of others in need. So it's part of that, isn't it? It's part of caring for creation, as we say for Eco Church. Something about who we are, how we care for one another, and how that spills over into the world. So that's compassionate. But you may have other things. Growing is one of these other kind of stretchy words we use in church. But I think, I think it means, first of all, it's something about we're intentional. We choose to think about growing in our Christian faith. Bishop Paul would have called abiding, uh, abiding in God. So it's about saying, we're not simply arrived. We are perfect now, and it's just a matter of countdown until we get to heaven. It's actually we have preparation to do so that we're ready to love God for eternity. So it's something about that, growing in our love and faithfulness to God. But it's also an attitude, a bit like the compassionate one. So we come thinking, God is rich, and he has given us enormous riches. It's not a case that, well, the church is shrinking, we're all getting older, we're all going to die in five years' time, that's the end of it. We're saying God is the God of the whole world. He pours out his grace daily upon us and all his people and all humanity. But we need to think that the world is rich. There are people out there who need to hear of God's richness, his grace, his salvation in Christ. So it's about not thinking, oh, how do we just manage decline, but how do we grow? And then it's about seeing fruit. I think we've been quite busy at doing things, but we haven't seen an enormous amount of fruit for what we're doing. But that has to change, doesn't it? When we think about running things, doing things, having programs, we've got to be able to be praying that fruit will come. Compassionate growing, and then reaching outwards in a sense, goes through all those. As we said, often the church is a lighthouse, not a clubhouse. We've got to continue to develop our ministry of invitation. You are invited, we say on our leaflet, don't we? And welcome. We've got to reach out, think about what we're doing in the light of uh, uh, how people see us. I met a man in the street yesterday, actually. He said, uh, I do commend your church or congratulate you or something like that. <laughs> What's this about? So I don't go to your church. I go to another church. But I'm so impressed with the things you do for the community. And I go, well, what kind of things is he thinking about? But anyway, he was, he was full of praise. And he said, he said my church does bugger all. <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell you which church that was. <laughs> so, you know, I say that because that's who we are. We have a reputation that we are connected with people. We want to bring people in and off, uh, share what we have, whether it's a, a film on a screen or a cup of tea or a church service or a, a scrapple and soup. We have that reputation. Let's continue to enrich and thicken out that reputation. And then lastly, I want to say, it's about honouring our front lines, which, of course, is, is something that Julian has been so good at reminding us all about, 
that our ministry is only secondarily here. It's primarily out in your lives, uh, 23-7. Yeah. So the clock is striking. I'm going to give you three or four minutes just to think now. What, Having heard all that word, what do I think we should be doing or under these headings? Expressing compassion, growing deeper and in fruitfulness, reaching out. And you may put things like connections that we are doing already. But you may think, I've always thought that we should be thinking about this. And this is my opportunity to put it down on a piece of paper and put it in front of the PCC. So have a little while thinking about that, and then I've got one more thing for us to think about before we finish. <clears throat> Can I move us on to the last page? Um, I did say at the beginning that I was going to ask you what can you do for the church as well as what the church can do for you, and here is that part. Um, and just some tick boxes. You may think of other things that you could do for the church. The space at the bottom if you want to do that. But I do want to put it this way. There's something at the heart of the church's life, and I put prayer there. And I honestly don't know the answer to this question. Uh, whether you pray for St. James occasionally, never, every day, every hour. I, don't, I honestly don't know what the baseline of this is. But I thought, what can I seriously lay upon you as a burden? And I thought, well, two times a week is not too much to ask people to pray for their church. We do it in church here. That doesn't count. Uh, <laughs> can I ask you, tick the box and say you pray for us all. Not just the vicar and the, and the associate minister and, and all the rest of that, people up the front. But, um, but it's all, twice a, month, uh, twice a week. Then I think you know, one of the challenges we face, we, and I talk now about the people at the front, is that we're here every, here every week, except we have our holiday, of course, I know. But other people come and go, and that's just the nature of life. But how much more encouraging it is to come into church when it's full rather than where, are, where is everyone today? And I think I would just challenge you, if this is a challenge for you, to say two, two times a month is my bottom line. I'm always at two or more times in church. Attack me afterwards. Um, give regularly, I'm not going to talk about, because on the whole, people are very good at giving regularly. And, and it's been a wonder to see through the lockdown how people have continued faithfully giving. We're not out of the woods by any means, the finances, but that's all. Then I was going to talk, I was going to write chat to someone after the service. And I thought chat's a very informal way. So I say talk to someone after the service. But actually I think, I think the challenge is to listen to someone after the service. Not to find someone to talk to, but to find someone to listen to. Now I don't mean when you go to church, uh, coffee afterwards, everyone sit in silence waiting for someone to speak. But you know what I mean. The priority is to listen rather than to speak. Then there are things that need to be done in any house, the chores, you know, and you enlist the kids as soon as possible. Uh, so here are some things, practical things that just have to be done to keep the place up and running and tidy and all the rest of it. So maybe you're doing some of these things, which is, that's an easy one to tick, isn't it? But maybe you think, well, I could help from time to time with one of those things. Then there's a kind of different thing, perhaps more at the front, perhaps more, you know, a bigger challenge uh, which I've called serving ministries. But the door is open. These, it isn't a closed shop and you have to have been to church for 69 years and where the, you know, have the right accent. You can come and do any of these things. And at the bottom, we have teams thinking about these things. <coughs> Connections, Eco Church, Flower Ranging, Messy Church, Visiting, Bell Ringing. You could also put Choir and, and on it goes. Uh, so I'm not going to give you any time to fill this in. You can do that in a little while while other things are happening. But this church only exists because people are volunteers. You know, uh, some of us are paid, but on the whole, most of the work is done by people who give their time and their good intentions. So please carry on to do that, but we need to think, how can we replenish our teams? I've run out of time. I could talk for more, but I hope you go away thinking you know, this project of being a church is brilliant. It's something that's going to last forever into eternity. It's something that works, lives, brings life 
to us now to be an authentic Christian community, to be a body of people who model their lives on the teaching and example of Jesus in the power of the Spirit. Wouldn't that be wonderful if we could all say, well, it was great in 2021, but in 2026, it's superb. We've made real progress. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for everyone here and everyone watching at home. That your names are known to you and you love us. Thank you too that in a different kind of way, you love the Church of St. James. It's not just an organization we invented to make things easier, but it has a place in your eternal plan to help us here in today in October 2021 to walk into a deeper and richer experience of being an authentic Christian community. In the name of Christ, amen.